Hello and welcome to another exciting Godot tutorial. I am Andrew Hoffman. I am a software engineer, a security researcher, and a technical author based out of the Pacific Northwest. Today I'm going to be showing you how to build infinite procedurally generated space within the Godot game engine. This will allow you to build games that are akin to a 2D version of, for example, No Man's Sky or Warframe where maps are generated on the fly or at load time. In this case, we're actually generating on the fly, which is even better than load time, because that means that a player can traverse as far as they want into the galaxy or into a dungeon without ever running into walls or boundaries. So if you're a subscriber to this channel, welcome back. If you're not a subscriber, watch the tutorial. If you like my content, drop me a subscribe on the bottom right hand corner it's the big red button on YouTube currently in the current generation of the UI and if you have any questions or comments leave them below the video so I started working on this because I've you know always been a fan of science fiction games and haven't played a ton of games in the past few years because I feel like that genre has kind of fizzled and so I was thinking how hard would it be to generate infinite space in the Godot language or sorry in GD script in the Godot game engine and it turns out it's not actually that hard. So what I started with was I created a new Godot project. I just named it 2D Space. And I only have two scenes. I have a player scene that uses the player controller we talked about in the top-down 2D uh, RPG tutorial that I released about two weeks ago. Go watch that if you haven't already. It co covers movement and collisions and all of that cool stuff. And um, that script is just inside of this player script right now. The movement script is in the read input block where it handles things dealing with velocity and assigns them to the user, which is, in this case, just simply a square sprite. Because that's not the important part of this tutorial. The important part is, if you look right here in my space scene, the space scene actually only has enough tiles to cover the game when the player loads in. So the camera is set to 400 by 400. When the player loads in, prior to them loading in, we're gonna load in some background tiles. But after they've loaded in, they can move around, and as you saw, they'll move around and perpetually see background space tiles wherever they go. And that's because what we're doing is we're projecting around the player. So we're projecting a coordinate grid above, to the left, to the bottom, and to the right. And if it's outside of the camera bounds, and there are no tiles at those positions, we draw the tiles prior to the camera being able to see that empty space. So how do we do it? So this is the way that I did it. So for starters, I have this space scene with this player controller and the player can move around the scene. I created this tile map called Space Tiles. And the way I configured it was with a tile set right here. And these tiles at the top are actually an atlas. So all of these are inside of one atlas. And I scaffolded out the initial tiles that you see right here in the game engine by clicking Enable Priority inside of Godot, which allows me to drop random tiles on the screen. But random tiles on the screen aren't really that great because, you know, we can only tile so much and we want infinite space. So we have to be able to tile from within the game engine and within the code. Well, how do we do that? So if we go to the player controller here, you'll notice that everything starts in the physics loop, physics process delta. So here, every time we iterate through a physics process, which is 60 times a second, we increment a count variable at the top. This is actually important because drawing tiles is pretty resource intensive. Next thing we do is reread the input and allow the player to move. That's not very resource intensive, so we do that every single physics process. But we're going to count, and whenever the count is divisible by 15, we're going to draw background tiles. Now this means that the function call to actually render new tiles is only going to occur a maximum of a few times per second versus 60 times per second, given the fact that it's dependent on the count being divisible by 15. So that's just kind of a cool trick. So we jump into the draw background tiles. What we do is we get the player position, and then we make a function called to another function called generate tile boundaries. And what this is going to do is it's going to look around the player, and it's just going to generate a grid of all the tiles the player can't see within a certain size. And you know, this the size right here is not really accurate to the current camera size because I was playing around with different camera sizes. But the important thing is 
you look at what the player can see and you get a list of all of the coordinates that the player can't see within a certain maybe you could call it um, distance to the player so you're finding the difference between what he can see within 20 meters and what he can't see within 20 meters and you're gonna return what he can't see so if your camera sizes you know gives him the ability to see 10 by 10 and perhaps you want to render 10 units out then you want to get everything that is 10 units beyond the 10 by 10 camera view that the player currently has access to and then you just return that in an array once you have that in an array you're gonna look through all of the items in that array and then you want to actually call get cells so tile map right here in this case space tiles has a function called get cell which returns an object representing that current cell now in order for us to actually get the tiles they all have to be loaded in when the game starts so we have a ready function up here that says get parent get node space tiles so before the game loads we'll get the tile map now when we have that coordinate from the boundary list for each boundary tile we are going to look at its cell now what we do here is we say if has tile um, so that's tile is greater than minus one so if there is nothing there if it is empty the tile object will have a minus one as its value and if it doesn't have anything set and this is just a performance optimization so if there's no tile there we're gonna call set cells we're gonna pass through background tiles we're gonna pass through some coordinates and an ID parameter I believe and it is required that every cell has an ID I do not believe it has to be unique. Yeah, it does not have to be unique. So here we say set cell, tile map dot set cell, x y id a couple optional parameters, and then get subtile title. Sorry, not title. It's always subtitle when you're watching a movie. Get subtile with priority. And so what does that do? So what we need to do once again is we start here. We get all the boundaries we need to generate tiles in. We check if they already have a tile. If we if they don't, we try to set a cell. And in order to set the cell, we have to get a subtitle using the priority field right here that allows us the capability to set random tiles. So then we have this get subtitle, or sorry, get subtitle with priority function that I wrote. And inside of this function, what you're going to do is effectively just grab a subtitle of the correct size and you're going to return it to the tile map set cell function and place it on the map so from a high level if we want to generate infinite maps using GD script project boundaries around the player in particular you're interested in boundaries that the player cannot see um, tiles on so there's no tiles existing there once you find the tiles um, that don't exist within this boundary make sure that the boundary is greater than the current camera size so you're going to project outside of the camera so the inside of the camera always has cells visible then what you want to do is just randomly set cells from your tile map onto those positions and you want to call that function on a regular basis in this case I put a little bit of a barrier in so it's not getting called every single physics frame but I think depending on the speed of the character, so if the character was moving at 300, you'd have to do it more rapidly than if he's moving at a speed of 150, for example. And in the end, you end up with a solution that looks like this, where here are the boundaries that we defined at start in the game engine, but regardless of where we go on the map, we have tiles being spawned, hence we have the ability to generate infinite background space. And amazingly enough, this is about all you need to generate objects and NPCs that spawn as well. As long as you don't want them to be consistently spawned at the same location, all you have to do is project into that space that the camera can't see and have a list of objects that you might want to spawn there. And then if you see there's no object at a location, spawn an object. It could be an item. It could be a weapon. It could be an enemy player or an ally player. Now if you want this to be consistent, so if the player goes back to the same location in another run of the game, it'll get a little bit more complicated. You're going to have to use a seed function. You're going to have to have an algorithm to determine what to spawn at a particular space. But if you're okay with pure randomness, this will allow you to build a procedurally generated universe. 
So that's all I really wanted to show today. I thought that was something kind of cool that I cooked up. So thank you for watching and tune in again soon.